Welcome back, viewers. This is Next 5 Minutes, Season 3 Premiere. You stuck with us throughout the years, through all the ups and downs, and you're back. It's like you don't give up, and we appreciate you. Let's get back to work. Let's pause here for some situational awareness. You'll see from the infographic below, we're spending 80 times more for the engagement ring than we're spending on premarital counseling. Now, we did touch on this subject before, but we brought it back with a twist. Let's start with married couples. Let's say that you and your spouse have opposing views on some subject matter. During the conversation, your spouse tells you that their position is based on some feelings that they have. Let's insert a gentle reminder here. When you effectively lead someone's feelings, you also, by default, lead the situation. This way, you don't have to lead all the incidentals. You see, their feelings will do this for you. Some event that they experienced long ago. They're going to tell you how they shared this traumatic experience with you in a conversation while you two were still dating. You recall this, but you struggle to reconcile these two events. Well, you perceive them as unrelated, but you realize that your spouse has attached these old feelings to this new situation. So they hold a position that is emotionally based while you are holding a position that is a principle based one. You see that? This is no longer a case of winning or losing. These two people, one who is principle based and one who is emotionally based should not be in a heated discussion even if they are married. Why? Because your very nice words, your intellect and or charm cannot neatly address all that is going on inside of your spouse. We know that they brought up their feelings, right? Well, feelings come from emotions. Emotions are a more primal way of feeling or experiencing life. But while we do experience emotions, hormones are released into our bodies like adrenaline. It prepares us to fight or flight. So your fancy words, no matter how good, cannot compete or neatly address the hormones, the chemical reactions, the emotions, the feelings, the memory, the trauma, all of these things going on inside of your spouse, even if they're standing still and they appear to be perfectly calm. Now, the operative word that I mentioned is feelings. And I told you this over the years quite a few times. Leaders don't just lead people. They lead relationships with people. But more importantly, they lead the feelings of those people that they lead the relationships that they're in. Watch this. So as a rule of thumb, Whenever someone self-discloses that their feelings are involved in a difficult situation, or if you detect feelings present, you must lead them. You must apply the principles of leadership. We spoke on this at length in many videos. You're going to lead your spouse, or anyone for that matter, that has their raw feelings exposed, you're going to lead them to a safe space. Now, I told you over the years that leadership is a discipline for the leader. But when this is put into the practice for those that you lead, it's comprised of two parts, coaching and mentoring. When I coach you, I come to you. When I mentor you, I call you to me. Coaching is what is needed in this situation. We have to put ourselves in their shoes. We have to see what they see and try to feel what they feel to empathize with them. That is also exercising emotional intelligence. We might say that our spouse is in their feelings, right? So we talked about feelings coming from emotions and the biochemical reactions that are happening as a result of this past trauma and the adrenaline that's running through us. So this stuff is coursing through your spouse's bloodstream to help them fight or flight. But at this time, they're just standing there. They're not fighting or flighting. But what happens to the human body when it experiences this? How long will this last? Do the hormones get sucked right back up into the adrenal gland? I don't know. I think it wise to give this person, but right now we're focused on the spouse, some space to process what they're going through. I wouldn't say things like, I understand, because clearly we don't, or we wouldn't have had the exchange, right? And if you're not married, you might say, wow, this marriage thing, it's a lot of work. Look at this one situation and all of these things are happening. Well, if you think it's too much, don't get married. But if you're already married, use caution. And you know, I can't take sides because I don't know which spouse is watching me right now. Okay, I wanna focus now on people who are in queue to be married. You have a budget for the wedding and you have a budget for premarital counseling. In the infographic that we showed you, the average number of premarital sessions is five at a cost of around $625 to $875 max, right? But the cost of the average engagement ring is $5,500. Huge difference. Now here's a setup for a hypothetical question. During one of our marital sessions, you feel uneasy answering some of the questions. Or you might even perceive that your spouse is feeling uncomfortable or uneasy, right? This is okay as long as you two have more premarital sessions and you can talk about these things and explore them further. But in this hypothetical question, what if this is the last scheduled session? 
but there is an opportunity or time to squeeze in additional premarital counseling sessions at a cost, but to offset that cost, you would have to cut some people out of the wedding party. What do you do? And you cannot change my hypothetical question. Now see, many people are of the mind that don't worry, it'll work out. I can tell you for a fact that premarital issues do not work themselves out. It's not gonna be one conversation and it will take great effort. Okay, hypothetical question aside, let's deal with a real world question. Would you prefer a small wedding and a beautiful marriage or a beautiful wedding and a small marriage? That's what this comes down to. If we're going for the large wedding and take a chance on a small marriage, we're in trouble here because you're going right from the wedding right into the marriage. It's the same day. If we do that, all we're taking into the marriage from the wedding is jewelry and pageantry. But I want to ask the married couples a question. For those of you who've had marital issues in the past, and this was known to those in your sphere of influence, whether it be friends and family members, how many of these people, knowing that you had these issues, stepped up or stepped in to say, hey, we've been married for a long time. We've had some issues. We worked them out. Why don't you come to our house? Why don't you sit with us over a period of weeks and maybe we can work on this? We want to know that you're still in love the same way that you were on your wedding day. How many people have made that offer to you? If it's zero, that tells a story. But if you told me, no, I've been in that situation with my spouse and four people have stepped up to come in and welcome us into their home or spend time with us to work out our issues. Well, I'm gonna answer that hypothetical question that I posed earlier. Invite those four people, right? Give me 12 more premarital counseling sessions. Everyone else who's not invited can watch virtually. That's what I would do, knowing what I know now. So what I'm saying is, most people who are invited to your wedding are not vested in the success of your marriage. Now, before you get upset with me, I'm not saying they don't care about it, but when most people realize that a couple they know is in trouble or some crisis, a, a marital crisis, they're going to say, well, I don't want to get involved, right? I understand that. But that's why I don't need all of these people at the wedding. Just give me the four people. Now, aside from money, there's a lot more involved with planning a wedding. We'll spend more time planning the wedding than planning the premarital counseling sessions, right? Uh, maybe we can talk to couples, uh, some couple that we know that have been married for a long time. Not that one couple that says they've been married for 35 years and they never had a fight. I don't believe that. I don't want their advice. But we can find that couple who's going to tell us we had those issues, we worked it out, and we can ask them, hey, can we meet with you three to four times prior to the marriage just to talk to you? That would be good. So you get the premarital counseling sessions. You can read some books. You can watch some videos. And you can talk to some actual couples that you know who can give you some advice. Today's session wasn't about making decisions for anyone. It was about providing information, uh, multiple perspectives, leveraging resources. It was about true love. If you love someone, you would put the time in. We have to make some serious choices here. And again, we're going to spend a lot of time on a wedding, but not enough time on a marriage or the premarital counseling. And that actually is the marriage. It's not the wedding. All right, that's it for this session. But we're going to cover this topic again in the future. Uh, we want to know that married couples are happily married. And those who intend to be married, well, we want to help them manage their expectations. If you have suggestions or ideas on how to go about these things, please share in the comments section. I'm Abrams. You're awesome. I'll see you in the next five minutes. This is Next 5 Minutes, The B-Sides. Good boundaries make good friends. You know how they say good fences make good neighbors? I agree with that. But I would also say good boundaries make good friends. Have you ever had a friend that asked you for a payday loan on the day after payday? What happened to your paycheck? Look, the day a friend of mine asked for a loan is the day they stop being my friend and become my customer. No, I wouldn't charge interest or threaten to break their legs. But I don't like that our friendship was leveraged for money. Okay, barring some catastrophic event, I don't borrow or loan. I say this because I have experience in the matter. Now, some people will try to repay the loan with nostalgia. They might start with, good friend, remember that time five years ago? Yes, I do. Now, where's my money? And why would you take me back to a time when you didn't owe me money? I remember the day after payday. I don't need friends that need me. Full stop, return, 
new paragraph. I don't need a friend to check on my spouse if I'm out of town. Nah, that's all right. Oh, you're having a bachelor party and you invite me? Okay. What's on the itinerary? Who's coming? I need to know these things because we can't have a video of Abrams rising, sitting on a couch with booty shaking in the background. And the next five minutes logo centered over my head. Nah, that's all right. You need someone to lie to your spouse about your whereabouts? Nah, that's all right. You have a get rich scheme that's only illegal if you get caught? Nah, that's all right. You want to know all the juicy details about my life? Look, what you share about yourself is personal, but only to you. To anyone else, this information is a commodity, and commodities can be traded. Nah, that's all right. I recall I had a girlfriend who I felt dismissed me without compunction. Her disposition changed so completely that I couldn't believe she was the same person. Well, years later, I bumped into her friend who told me that she liked me too. She went on to say that her mistake was in not telling me this, but she told her friend, the one that I dated. Hmm. You see, her friend wanted to beat her to the punch and decided to pursue me. So, to one of these friends, I was a prize, and to the other, I was a loss. I don't know which was worse, going through it or receiving the truth about it. Even more surprising, that girlfriend that I had married someone else within less than six months of our breakup. I know you felt bad for me until I told you she married someone else. Now you're like Abrams, you dodged a bullet. Years before that, my early 20s, I hung out with a group of good people. Two of them were a married couple. One day, the wife said to me, you know, Sean, you only come around when my husband is here. We're all friends. You can stop by at any time. Now watch how smooth she was. She said these words to me, or rather extended the invitation to me, in the same room her husband was in, but he wasn't with an earshot. Now, why didn't she say this when he could hear it? Hmm. She wanted me to believe that her husband's proximity to the conversation meant that he was consenting to her offer. Nah, that's all right. This may sound harsh, but if you are my friend, you understand that we have these boundaries. Now, if you can't find your 5 eighths wrench, okay, I can loan you mine. But you can't borrow my Makita power drill, no. Do you know some people won't buy an item if they know that you have one that they can borrow? If you heard what I had to say in the Frenemy series, you know that I see friends in a different light now. Mama said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Well, my future is bright, not because I have friends, but because I have boundaries. And with that, I use words from my mouth and my heart to declare peace, love in your life, in your body, your finances, relationships, your career, home, possessions, your children, and your understanding. There, I said it. These words will not be recalled. Full stop. Abrams rising.